Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world. It's time to experience the O's on the Original Sports Podcast. Sizzling, what's going on with you, bad man? Not much. I shaved for the show. Uh, got a lot of compliments. <laughs> <laughs> got a new razor. <laughs> I took a nice hot shower after I ran around. I got... I was supposed to go give a little plasma and make my 55 bucks, but I just wasn't feeling it. So I ran over and played a, a 15 holes at disc golf. I did so good on the first nine. I was plus one. Should have been even, but I made a dumb throw. Back nine, I was just miserable. I, I did. I only played six holes, and I was plus six. I was like, damn. You know? Sounds like, like a little blood, sweat, and tears to me. Uh, I'm getting <laughs> better. My throws are getting better. My drives are getting better, but – you know, you just got to keep playing and playing and playing. Uh, I'm addicted, yeah. so it's not a problem with playing it. Yeah, you know? just ask I, him. He, he's been playing his video games for years, and he's really good at them. I'll bet he is. <laughs> he knows all that. <laughs> all that buttons. <laughs> hey, says our guest this week on the OSP has been part of the Pittsburgh Penguins media for, for many years, and will be sharing his insight on the last, the uh, on the past, the present, and the future of the organization from his perspectives. Uh, Bob Grove covered the Penguins for 17 seasons at the Washington Observer Reporter and 14 seasons for the Pittsburgh Sports Report. Uh, he spent 16 uh, seasons on the Penguins Radio Network. Uh, he wrote Pittsburgh Penguins, the official history of the um, first 30 years and contributed to the second edition of Total Hockey, uh, the official encyclopedia of the National Hockey League as well. So. Um, Bob will be joining us shortly. Uh, right now, though, um, I thought we'd talk a little NFL football since since we have a little bit of time. Sis, what do you think of uh, the weekend games? NFL weekend games? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I watched a little of the Thursday night game, and the main weekend game I saw was the Steelers, obviously, because I was up in the Berg. I uh, watched till the third quarter, and then – on my way home, I tried to watch a little of that uh, Cowboys-Dallas game, but it wasn't working out going through the mountains and whatnot. <clears throat> and then I think I watched uh, some of that Sunday night game. Uh, the Rams and Lions game was really good. And I watched a little bit of last night's game, the Jets and the Niners. Overall, just good to be back in the football season, swing of things. I don't know if I told you guys I'm helping coach the girls. Inaugural season of flag football. And then, you know, you see across the field, the team's working out, son's playing for, uh, football for local high school, just having fun in the football swing of things. Um, but there, I don't think there are really any big shockers or surprises um, this week one. Uh, I do. I think the Cincinnati some, game was a, some close was games. a shocker. I was going to say that one would probably be the only one that really stood out. I didn't expect the Patriots uh, to do as well as they did, or, you know, even beat the Bengals. The Bengals were very dismal, only scoring 10 points. Other than that, like I said, nothing really stood out to me. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with Cincinnati, in my opinion. Like, you know, here, here you go with Joe Burrow being back. This is, what, year four for him? And yes. he, was, he was injured two years and got shut down two years, went to the Super Bowl one year, right? They went to the Super Bowl one year with him. His second year, last year got hurt, and then now he's, you know, this year. So it, it's going to be interesting. I don't know if they have the same amount of weapons. They lost Joe Mixon in the backfield. They lost Tyler Boyd at receiver. I don't know how happy T. Higgins is, even though they paid him. Jamar Chase once paid. You know, uh, Burrow always has issues with his offensive line they really haven't solidified that for him so that that's going to be something to keep an eye on um what'd you make of the situation with Tyreek Hill what was your take on that for those of you who don't know Tyreek Hill was pulled over going over 100 miles an hour in Miami on his way to the game uh on Sunday 100 miles an hour over 100 I thought it was like 120 uh see so yeah, Sammy Hagar is gonna have to write a new song I can't drive 125 uh <laughs> It's crazy. crazy. First of all, he didn't even have a seatbelt on. No. Uh, you know, going that fast, 
it looked like a two a four lane highway maybe at most uh so it's just a knucklehead for doing that but manhandled the way he was was not not looking good for the dade county police um it's all over social media if you haven't seen it check it out um it was it was unnerving to say the least and what he did though during the game was kind of bizarre i don't i don't agree with that but that's not to say how he was handled was acceptable by any stretch of the imagination have you seen the video have you watched the video and heard the voice yes okay so when the cop knocks on his window and he says don't knock on my window and he tells him roll it down and he rolls it up you know he wrote it down and wrote it right up and he said roll your window down he refused to do it he told him several times that eventually he opens the door and he tells him get out of the car get out of the car get out of the car he refused to do it yeah. he was refusing everything that this cop has done he's no angel dude he was arrested when he was in college. He was arrested a few years ago, and it was proven he broke his infant, you know, his little kid's arm. But they didn't have enough evidence to go on to do whatever they wanted to do. He's just not a good dude. Okay, maybe he shouldn't get roughed up by the cops. Okay, that's whatever. That okay, all right. The, the cops need to be professional too, from that perspective. But you know, he's just not a good person. Just follow directions. Just because you're a professional athlete, make 30 million, 50 million, whatever you make a year, doesn't mean you're special. You know, I, I don't like that shit. You know, I just I don't I don't subscribe to it and I think it's bullshit. And that's part of our society's problem. Yeah. Uh he was being a knucklehead about, you know, be, he's not a knucklehead, just being controversial, I think. Um I, I don't know. It, it, from from what we gather from our friends of color. I wouldn't be pushing it like that whenever they, you know, have guns and I don't know. I would just been very compliant and it was, it was frustrating to see on both ends. And I felt more for Tyreek because I, I didn't want to see him be mistreated more than what he was already was, but it was bad. I thought on both ends. At some point though, you know, you've got to recognize that the police have a job to do. Him driving over 100 miles an hour in a completely blacked out car through the middle of Miami on his on his way to the game is not is not admissible. That's the, you know that just that doesn't make him special. If he's late, he's late. That's his fault. Yeah, he shouldn't get any special privileges. If that was you or me who did what he did, we'd be in jail still. Yeah, yeah. still. So would Scotty Scheffler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I just – I have a problem with it. Hey, did you see any of Caleb Williams' uh, inaugural game? I saw some highlights, uh, which were pretty much lowlights. I wouldn't say uh, he did anything really, again, to stand out. What, what the, he was uh, – he you know, he threw for 93 yards. That's a good way to break in to the NFL. 15 rushing yards. Uh not uh, anything to ride home about. They did get the W, though. Yeah, none of those rookie quarterbacks did much. Uh, Jane Daniels for Washington. But you know what? I'll say this about Washington. They look like they're turning the corner. Yes. Well, hey, Jaden Daniels probably had the best of the three starting rookie quarterbacks. He was 184 with 88 rushing yards and two TDs, two rushing touchdowns, and they lost. And then Bo Nix, on the other hand, um, he won that starting job uh, he had two INTs. He threw for a buck twenty-eight and thirty-five rushing yards. But so at the end of Caleb the day, Williams, of the three, I would say did the worst. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, did you happen to uh, take a peek at Jordan Love's injury? Is that is that going to be detrimental to him? No, is that going to linger all year? No. Oh, that's that's a good question about lingering. Uh, I did see though that uh, it's not. They're not putting him on the injured reserve, which means he's not going to have to sit out four games. So it probably will be week to week. Yeah, they however, said they're going to evaluate him this week. Yeah, however, um, it, it could linger for a couple of weeks. But then once he comes back into that starting role, it'll be quite interesting to see what happens. But Malik Willis is going to take over the helm and see what he can do against Indy this week. 
I don't expect anything out of Malik Willis, to be quite honest with you. The guy didn't, he didn't really play down in Tennessee. And when he did, he wasn't, what was he? You know, he really wasn't. He, he was a guy coming out of college that was probably the best of a worst batch of quarterbacks in a long time. You know, that was the, that was the picket draft. Uh, that was, who else is in that draft machine? Pickett, uh, what's his name? Uh, Malik Willis, the quarterback. Was it, was it Levis? Who? Levis? Will Levis? Yeah, yeah Levis. actually. Yeah. That actually, couldn't have been, it couldn't have been Levis because he replaced uh, uh, Willis. That's right. Levis Levis came out last Just year with Pickett, CJ Ryder, Stroud. Ritter, Willis, Corral. Cor yeah, Matt Corral. Zappi, yeah. Howe. Oh, yeah. Dokin, Skyler Thompson, and Mr. Irrelevant, Purdy. Oh, there's your best one out of the bunch. And yeah. he was the last one chosen. You yeah. know, that's <laughs> that says a lot, if you ask me, but who the hell is yeah. asking me, right? So um, let me think, what else did we witness? Well, the Steelers lost their punter that they invested a hell of a lot of money in. Uh, that, what do you that, think about the guy? What do you think about the guy to get brought in? I like him. I wanted him to be. He came in last year when Percy Harvin was injured. I don't know if you remember. He punted the crap out of the ball, and I don't know. I don't know why they let him walk away last year. Like mm. he can punt the ball, right? You know, yeah. is he as good as Cameron Johnston? No, but Cameron Johnston is actually the best in the league. But, you know, this guy's going to fill in okay. He's going to do what he needs to do, you know, in my where's, opinion. Where's Harvin now, or did he just eat his, his way to the he was, at, he was with the Niners, and then he got released. He got cut, yep, he got cut from the Niners, you know. So that's ain't, crazy. Nobody, ain't nobody picking up Harvin. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I mean, but he wasn't good in Pittsburgh. I know, uh, I'm just saying, I thought we, I thought we had a good one. With, with Harvin? Yeah, he was he was good in college. Yeah, he was real good in college. <laughs> so it was the Paul, so it was the Paul Vida. You know, Paul. the interesting fact, thing about that machine is that shouldn't have a big significant change going from college to the pros as far as kicking and punting. You know what I mean? It's not like I, you're playing playing a different level of guys. I agree. You know, like that should have never changed. Maybe it was when his father passed away that it really – you know, impacted him kind of like, you know, step on to it, left football when his brother was killed. Yeah. But I mean, but you know, watching, watch, especially watching pit football, they, they seem to always keep a good field goal kicker, but those guys never make it to the NFL some, for some bad R reason. So maybe right. there is, maybe there is a pro, maybe there's uh, some sort of difference, especially if you're kicking down that uh, Acre shore because of the wind and everything, and you still can kick 50 yard field goals, you would think people would be jumping on you, but. Think we got any in the NFL kicking field goals? I think Chops is trying to join us, but it says his device is not connected. Yes. Um, we're we're a couple minutes away from Bob Grove joining us to talk uh, Penguin hockey. I'm I'm kind of excited to have a conversation with him, uh, see what he knows about the Crosby contract, see what he thinks about the things Dubas are doing. Um, you know, Pittsburgh hasn't been the same in the last couple of years. They've coming up short. Age is showing up for them a little bit. Um, the bottom, the bottom two lines have, I don't know how many years it's been now, four, five years. The bottom two lines are insignificant, yeah. you know, and that's killing them. That's yeah. killing them. So well, it's going to be. Do they to change have their style? Do they change their style because they were running gun, you know, offense where they were just uh, predicated on speed. And so, what do they do? Do they just revamp the whole thing? Do they find guys to fit the system? Is Solly out of, you know, we've been talking about him. He's got to be on the hot seat, right? I don't think they're ever going to let, let him go. I don't know. We could ask Bob his thoughts on that. But I, I think I think that guy won a couple of Stanley Cups. He made a hell of a run for a long time uh, making the playoffs. Uh, they He's still believe three. in him. You know, uh, and at this point, let's just hope that they keep pushing the right buttons and get things going forward. So, hey, let's welcome Bob on the show. <clears throat> Mr. Grove, how are you? I'm great, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, to your, uh, I don't know, I, I, Terry Young, 
uh, Rasheen Hill, part of Barry. our uh, barbershop crew. My other guy is still trying to get in. His computer crashed just as we were getting online tonight. And I was kind of like, wow, seriously, dude. So well, he's still working on that. But uh, he'll be joining us hopefully shortly. Michael Mills. Uh, we're all Pittsburgh guys. Uh, you know that I'm from Vandegrift. Uh, Terry is actually my my nephew and uh, Shh, you know Bill, you. Billy's cousin. And uh, Rasheen has uh, been a really good friend of mine for over 20 years. He's from uh, the city. So uh, well, it's great to be with all of you. And we, when we talk about Vandergrift, you know, in the AK Valley, that's that's my home as well. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Hey, where did it all start for you? Uh, what made you want to be part of the Penguin Media? Well, you know, to be honest, Mark, you know, you go through college. I mean, I went to Penn State and got a journalism degree. And at that point, you know, I wanted to be a writer, um, number one. I had done um, an internship writing news at the, at the Sharon Herald. Um, so I wasn't necessarily thinking exclusively about the Penguins or sports, although that's absolutely, if you'd have asked me when I was still in college, like what would be your dream job? I'd say being, being a, a beat writer uh, covering the Penguins for sure. But, you know, you know how life is. You're never sure where it's going to take you. Yep. Um, and so, um, you know, it just worked out for me that, uh, you know, I, I graduated from Penn State in 81 got a job um, in Clearfield uh, working at the Progress newspaper and was only there a few months. And um, the, the Observer reporter down in Washington, PA, had an opening for a, somebody on the sports staff to cover the Penguins. It was like, you got to be kidding me. I said, you know, so I went down for the interview and uh, fortunately got that job. And uh, that's how it worked out. At, at that point, that they were still in kind of in limbo trying to find their way. They're just a, uh, basically they're, they're, trying to find Mario. That's what they were trying to do, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you go back to the early 80s, right. They were, um, you know, they were barely a playoff team, but they weren't, you know, they weren't going to get in the playoffs and do anything. Um, and, and certainly, you know, the 81 season, they had a, they had a chance to do something, 82. Um, you know, we all remember what that was like against the Islanders in the playoffs. Um, uh, but, you know, 81 against the Blues was a heartbreaker as well. So that's sort of where they were. Um, yeah, at that point, I mean, a lot of people were thinking, God, you know, when when are we ever going to have the superstar superstar? Yeah. Um, you know, the, obviously, the Penguins have had some stars through the years, and you could think about LaRouche and Apps and Pronovo and those guys. Um, but, you know, they hadn't had one of the elite players in the league. And then, you know, along comes the 83-84 season where they're the worst in the league, and um, they get Mario Lemieux and the rest, as they say. Uh, is history and uh, it, you know it couldn't have worked out any better for the Penguins. Um, look, I mean, you got to be honest with the way it's worked out for them. If you think about, you know, a lot of people think about the Penguins. They think about perennial uh, playoff teams, like 16 years in a row. Um, and, you know, they had a long streak before that. Um, you know, starting <clears throat> with Mario and, and the crew in '91. Um, but you know, the Penguins were fortunate. You know, they got bad at the right time. They got Mario, and then they got bad again at the right time, and they got Sid. Yeah, I, I I used to love going down to the igloo, spending fifteen bucks and sitting eight rows from the glass center ice. That was my favorite, and they were not very good back then, but it was still my favorite thing to do back in high school. Who did well, have Zalapsky? Zalapsky? No, he was down the road. <laughs> Charlie Zalapsky. Hey, hey, Bob! Shout out to the beat writers. I appreciate you being on here. Uh, my nephew's working for the Daily Chief in Upper Sandusky. He just graduated from the from the O, the original Ohio. Um, hey, let's dig into this a little bit. Tell us about your experience when the when the Pens won the cup. What was what was it like in the locker room around around the town? Uh, and did you get to put your lips on that thing? <laughs> No, I did not. I mean, I got to, I mean, I got to, uh, I got to be around the cup, um, you know, the next couple of days after they had won it. And, you know, the media were there covering the, uh, um, you know, the ceremonies in Pittsburgh, you know, down at the point. Uh, I got to be around the cup a little bit there. got some pictures with it then. And a little bit later in the summer um, was fortunate enough. And, um, you know, anyone who's been around the Stanley Cup has that same kind of feeling if you're a big hockey fan. Um, it's like it's in, it's unreal to just touch the thing and to just be standing beside it and, and getting wow. a picture taken with it. So so that was um, that was my, my thing with the cup. But what was it like to be? I mean, it was nuts. 
was absolutely nuts in the city at that point. You remember what it was like going out to the airport tonight. They wanted, you know, I was in Minneapolis when they wanted, so I didn't get to see the airport scene, but I saw the video of it. It was insane. Uh, people who went through that and got stuck on the parkway going out there, um, their memories of it, um, you know, the video of the team trying to wade through the crowd when they got to town. Um, it was just, it was absolutely insane. Um, and it was, it was great to see. It, it was, it was absolutely, I mean, you know, it's the easy word is surreal, but I mean, growing up, I mean, I saw my first Penguin game in 1970. Um, so, you know, I always wondered as a fan, would we ever really see this happen? Would we ever see them win a Stanley Cup? And then if you remember, you know, you get Mario and it's not like, oh, boom, we got Mario the next year. We're in the playoffs. No, that's not how it worked. It took them five years just to get in. Uh, and it took them, you know, it took them seven to make a, a, a long run and win it. Uh, but um, yeah, so you wondered what it would be like. And, you know, I can remember filing the story that night from Minneapolis and you go into the third period with a lead like that. You, you said, you know, I, I actually had people calling me saying, do you believe what you're seeing? And uh, it was, that kind of, it was, it was that kind of a night. Wow. And uh, we were at the rally at the point 91. That's what you're talking about. I think I, I recognize you. You had the Yager mullet. You were wearing that Yager mullet, right? <laughs> it would have been, if I had one, I would have been one of many, many people who had it, right? Because he was so popular, right? I mean, that, that was one of the things about that. That was a fun team. That was a and he only knew, fun. he got up there, he only knew five words. Elvis has left the building. That's all he yeah. could say. Yeah, well, he was tight with Mike Lang, I mean, throughout his career. And so he would learn, he would learn from Mike. But he, he was, he was, he was so much fun to be around. And, you know, uh, you could see his love for the game even at that age, which, which has proven over the years. But, you know, Kevin Stevens was just a big guy with a huge personality. Um, you know, wow. Ronnie Francis, Alf Samuelson, those guys who had been around the league and probably themselves started to wonder if they'd ever get a chance to win it. And then Mario, of course, and Recky, you know, a guy <laughs> in the later rounds, a smaller guy. Is he ever, can he really be a scorer in the National Hockey League? Yeah, he's been good in the Western League. Uh, but can he really be good? And, you know, today's in the Hall of Fame. Well, what I think last, if I remember right, when Yager finally quits and they finally put him in the Hall of Fame, there'll be nine players from that team who are in the Hall of Fame. Wow. So Jeez. that's, you know, yes, they had an incredible skill level. Yes, they had an incredible player in Mario. Um, but there was also, there was a little bit of, um, you know, Trottier was so good in, in so important to Yager's development, but was so good still on the ice. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't find a, a more competitive guy than Brian Trottier, no matter what his age was. Um, so that, that team had everything. You know, they had Badger, uh, you know, patting them on the back when they needed it, not ripping them. They had uh, – every guy played that little bit of a role. But, um, you know, they were – they were something they were something to watch. And for me, one of the things that I remember most about that run, when I talk about all this talent, but I'm also talking about the personalities, um, there's a little cockiness there. And let's be honest, you need that when you want to be when you want to win a championship, you need somebody. Now, Kevin Stevens in Boston, they go down two nothing. He stands up in front of the media and says, We're gonna win the series. Now, remember, they're down two games to none to a Bruins team that was not only good, but just made a living out of just beating the heck out of the Penguins. Had experience, had much more playoff experience than the Penguins had. You're, and you know what it's like. I mean, I don't know, I have the stat off the top of my head, but when you're down 0-2 in a playoff series, you're pretty much done. Yeah. Most of the time. And he stands there in Boston and says, we're going to win the series. That's the kind of attitude they have. And that's what, that's what winners have. They seem to have great chemistry, too, on that team. You know, hey, Bob, and he was, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just, I was just going to talk about like guys like Troy Loney, you yeah. know, Jock Collender. They brought up. I, I mean, they just seemed to have good chemistry. No matter who came through the doors, uh, they fit right in. They had their roles defined. Yep. And, you know, under Badger. That that was that's always point. good. Knowing your role is always good. That's right. Oh. Troy Loney. Troy Loney didn't have to be anything he wasn't. Phil Bork didn't have to be anything he wasn't. You know, Randy Gillum didn't have to be anything he wasn't, etc. So. That's when you know you have something special. Hey, Bob, uh, I know you were around for many of Mario's uh, health struggles. Can you describe uh, what drove him to always come back and make a difference? Well, you you have to have, uh, you know, the amount of uh, 
you have to will yourself to do a lot of things when you're in those situations. Um, you, you know, it was good that he had so much support and people behind him, but at the end of the day, he had to believe he could do it. Uh, he had to believe he could come back. And, you know, he, you know, he's done many interviews where he talked about the fact, you know, he wasn't sure he was going to walk again. You know, he didn't know what he was, was going to be able to do. Um, so it's really down to his character. I mean, that's the thing that made it happen. And yeah, you know, the doctors um, gave him the, the right, you know, the right way to recover from this. But um, especially when you get knocked down the way he did, one thing after another, um, you know, you know uh, the, the cancer diagnosis. It just was, it was so scary to watch one guy go through this um, and to see, you could see it, you know, after games when he was in so much pain and, you know, the stories are, are well known, you know, people have to tie his skates, um, et cetera. But he believed he had the will and he believed he was going to find a way to get things done. And um, boy, did he deserve those two cups. Wow. I just wish he could have been healthy for longer because he would have won more than two. More, more importantly, were you in the wine cellar? Have you been to the wine cellar? <laughs> no. That's all we hear. They talk about Lemieux uh, on the ice, but the, he has this immaculate wine cellar. That's all you know. You hear. Yeah. Right about. yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's one of his things. You know, he loves the golf. He loves wine, etc. And he's got the he's got the money to be able to go out and get the things that he wants, and uh, he deserves it. So um, it's been. Uh, you got to tell know. him you're doing a special piece on wine. You, you know, you you, give, you still got connections there. You can go see him. <laughs> I don't have those kind of connect. I don't have those kind of connections. But um, he he was he was. Uh, I'm I'm privileged to, to say that I, I had a chance to watch him. And, uh, Fantastic. And hey, cover. Well, I, I got to say this about Mario. He always had time for the fans. Yeah. He always like I. I mean, it, it was amazing to to just watch him interact with people, even when he was hurt. Is this what's is this what's part of what's missing from this team? Is is Mario's personality and his his uh, drive, so to speak, missing from this team right now? No, I, I don't think it's that. I mean, you, you get you get the drive, you get the same kind of drive from Sidney Crosby, right? You know, I mean, he's won three Stanley Cups. Um, and you get um, every, every look. Every team is really different. Um, I don't care how many you know. Look. We know in professional sports today, you, you never bring back the same players every season. Yeah. Even when you win Stanley Cups, yeah. probably especially when you win Stanley Cups. Look at the, the number of Florida Panthers that have already left that team. Yeah. So you, you have to you have to sort of reinvent yourself every season. And um, you know the Penguins right now, you know to compare compare them with you know like Mario's Cup teams. We just talked about how many Hall of Famers they had. You don't have that kind of talent level with today's team. You know, you had it in a couple of special seasons in 16 and 17, and you had it in 09. But no, Sid's absolutely able to, to give you the same kind of drive that, that Mario did for sure. Yeah, I got to I gotta appreciate that. It, who made your job hard as a coach when you were working with the Penguins? What coach made your job hard? Well, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. When you're a beat guy, um, they can make it frustrating. I don't know if they can make it really difficult. Um, they could if, if you have a, a, a tighter relationship with them. I mean, one of the things about, you know, I was a beat guy to 40,000 circulation suburban paper. So I wasn't traveling with the team during the regular season. I traveled in the playoffs, but that was it. So I didn't have the same sort of relationship with coaches that a guy at the Post Gazette or the Press would have had. Mm -hmm. We're literally with these guys every single day. Yeah. Nearly every single day. Um, and so I think if, if you're around like that, um, then it can start to get difficult because you, you probably rely on them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I can think of Bob Barry and, you know, um, so what I was going to say was it's not difficult so much as sometimes it's frustrating. Yeah. Um, and Bob Barry could be a good quote um, when he wanted to be. Uh, uh, but, you know, he often, when I think about some of the years he was coaching, so, did, you know, the Mario's first three years, um, it was not unusual for him. I don't know. I'd have to go back and think maybe three, four times a season. He wouldn't show up for the media, uh, for the media uh, grilling after the game. And I can, you know, we can all remember, all of us guys who were back there can remember uh, Cindy Himes, who was the Penguins PR director at the time. Just, she would walk into the, we'd all be standing there waiting for him. And she'd walk in and she'd just say, 
She says, Coach Barry has no comment. The room is open. <laughs> uh, hey, that, uh, it, it got to be funny after a while. But so, yeah, that was Bob Barry kind of checking himself, I think. He had some nights he probably said, best for me not to go there. Who knows what I might do. The Badger must have been just remarkable to work with, though. He just seemed like a, a huge personality himself with he everybody. Was. He was. He absolutely, he absolutely was. He was. Um, he means everything that's been advertised from people who are around him and talk about him. <clears throat> um, he was. He was engaging. He was a nice guy who would talk to you uh, about anything. I mean, I can remember him. You know, talking in the playoffs about, hey, you know, what are you guys doing, and the, the importance of getting out, and you know, going to see a movie or going doing getting away from hockey for a little bit, and maybe going to do something different. And, uh, I can remember going in there to do um, one day I went in to do an interview with him um, and he was in his office after practice and I got in there and he said, oh, he said I've had a long day. He said yesterday I had a long day. I was out. I was shopping for clothes. I, you know, I needed some suits. And he like he went into the cupboard and said, I bought this one. What do you think? And I bought, you know what I mean? He says, I got this pair of pants and, you know, I was good. And so that's not a conversation you're preparing yourself to have. Right. <laughs> But that's the way Bob was. Bob could relate to you. You know, Bob could absolutely relate to you on anything. Um, and um, you know, the players will all tell you, even though they had an adjustment to make with his uh, style of coaching. Um, you know, at the end of it, uh, they just gave him so much credit for making them the team that they they became. He really set the he set the stage for the next how many years now? We're kind of riding riding what he put in place, and in essence. Uh, for years, the expectations of the Pittsburgh Penguins, you know. So. No, he did. Well, I mean, he, he's look, he's the guy who helped them become a champion for the very first time. Yep. You know, I'm sitting here talking about the 91 team and the, the talent and the personalities and all that other kind of stuff. But you can have you can have it looks like everything you need on paper. But until you do it, until you do it, it, it's, it doesn't mean anything. And mm -hmm. those are the guys who did it. And, and, Bob, and Badger Bob helped them do it. Yep. Um, so yeah, absolutely help set help set the tone for for what could be possible for them. And certainly we saw that because he had the other, you know, he went completely in the other direction. You had a guy, Scotty Bowman, who didn't really get along that great with players, and mm -hmm. really didn't really didn't anywhere he coached wasn't really great with players. But I mean, when a game was being played, once the clock, once the puck dropped, and you and you said who's the best guy to have maybe behind the bench to get the feel of a game and make adjustments that you needed for a game. Probably Scotty Bowen's at the top of everybody's list. Yeah. So, other than coaches, we go to players. Who would be your favorite player to interview over these years that you've been doing this? And what was your favorite interview? Describe that for us. Well, I tell you, you know, I, I, I'll be uh, favorite interview. I I can't um, I, I can't really say one interview stands out for me. To be honest with you, I um, I know that you know this is going to sound this will sound crazy. Um, but one of the, in my times, one of the best players to give you an interview. And when I mean best players, I'm saying not spitting cliches at you, yeah, not telling you what you think you're going to hear, <laughs> but actually listening to a question and giving you a, a, an answer that, um, was, was really well thought out was Tom Barrasso. Mm. Oh, wow. And I mean, he was this guy was a very intelligent hockey. He's in the Hall of Fame now as a player. He's an intelligent hockey man, knows the game, understands the game. And I can remember an interview I did with him, which went a lot longer than we, we normally talk. You know, it, it was a one on one. I just happened to catch him and he was in a good mood because I, I don't I don't maybe I need to you know frame it because he was not good with the media. And, um, you know, and he was not good with the media and we didn't, none of us liked the way he handled himself. But what I'm just saying, that's an interview I did that was really, really good. And yeah. he really had some thoughtful answers about playing goal and about the way he developed as a kid um, in, in playing goal. And it was a rarity to get him on a day like that. You more, you more times you got him when he had nothing to say or you would ridicule your question. And I'm not excusing that behavior, it was, it was awful. Um, but that was one that stood out. But as far as a guy who I'd love to go to and talk to, it was Phil Bork. <laughs> Phil, Phil Bork was the guy. He was the guy because I'll tell you what, he would cut through all the BS. He was another guy who he wouldn't give you, you know, uh, yeah, you know, we got to be better and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he would just put it in plain English for you. And he like he was, you know, 
sitting at the bar with you. Um, and, and he would say, you know, we're all, we've been awful. We got nobody to blame, but ourselves. Um, and I mean, he, he would just, he would really tell it like it is. And I was, uh, it was such a privilege of mine to work with him in the radio booth all those years. Cause he really helped me along the way too. you know, figure out the whole radio piece of it. Um, and he is so good in that job. So yeah. I'm, I'm so glad he's still around. Sometimes I catch him. He, he wants, you know, he wants to spill something out of his mouth and, and he'll just bite his tongue. You, you hear it coming. I mean, <laughs> it's just hear it coming. I mean, I, I still love listening to the radio. I, I mean, I watch every game, but I still like turning off the volume and listening to the radio. There's just something about the vision of the game in my, in my brain. It's like baseball too. Well, Mark, I'm the same way. Um, look, because I tell people that I, and this is the thing that, you know, when I got a chance to be, uh, in, on, on the Penguins broadcast team, it was team. It was an incredible thrill for me. All those years that I did it, it was a thrill every single day, every single night. One of the reasons was to working with guys like Bork and like Mike Lang, who was so helpful to me. He was just incredible to me, um, and I'd listen to as a kid. Um, you know, it was it was. I had to pinch myself that I was even doing this, and and I grew up with listening to the Penguins on the radio, and I can go. I can remember the days. So I saw my first game in 1970, but I mean, if you go back to 71, 72, right, you know, there were games, first of all, they weren't on TV. Every road game was not on TV. They weren't on TV all that much. In fact, they had some trips to the West Coast back then when they'd go to play L.A. and the Oakland Seals or they'd go to Vancouver. There was no Pittsburgh radio. The game wasn't on the radio. When you got up for, when you got up for school the next morning, you had to turn on KDK in the morning and listen to John Steinbeck. And so he'd give you the score. Yeah. That's when you find out who won the game, <laughs> you know? Hey. So I grew up with the rate, the Penguins on the radio, you know, listening to Starkey and listening to Forney and listening to Lang. So it is, I, I totally agree with what you just said. And, and now I listen to, I quite often many night, at least I would say, probably three to four nights a week, I am listening uh, via the internet to NHL game, other NHL games when the Penguins aren't playing on the radio. Yeah. Some of them I do have the, the ability to go watch on TV, but I'm just like you. There's there's a magic about radio that I've never gotten out of my system. 100%. I, a good story for you. I used to hang out when I, in my younger days down in the, the South Side, and uh, at least once every, say, Three weeks, we would go into the Blue Note down on the south side, and there'd be Lang sitting there having a glass of, you know, brandy or whatever he was drinking, and we'd just roll up and talk to him, you know, sit down, fellas, you know, like he was that guy. Yeah. He was that guy. He absolutely was that guy, and he lo he lo he loved interacting with fans. And I mean, I you know, I'm sure today he's still doing it. Um, he loved interacting with fans, and and he, and he appreciated all of them. And he appreciated all the people that he worked with. He was an incredible guy to be around in those years for sure. And he liked his music like that. Yep. The blues. Yeah. Hey, Bob, we're going to fast forward here uh, to the Sidney Crosby era. How has the organization been different since he's joined? Well, we talked earlier about the drive that he gives the team. Um, but, you know, he's a guy who, look, I don't think there's any question he inspires those around him. Um, he said, you know, he got surrounded with some good talent early, you know, after his first year when they were so, so bad, you know, Mario's last season and, you know, Mario couldn't finish the season, unfortunately, because of his heart issue. Um, you know, the next year, here comes Malkin, you know, here comes Stahl. Um, you know, they started, there comes Flurry. They started to surround these guys, you know, him with really talented young players, but trust me, these guys get they were inspired by what they saw from Sid. What they could tell what he was doing in the offseason. They could see what he was doing every night on the ice when he was a target for every everybody they played with. So that part of it hasn't been any different at all. And that's why the Penguins are so fortunate. You go from one superstar like Mario to another like Sid, and both of them had surrounding cast of Hall of Famers, as we've discussed. Um, you still need the guy who's the heartbeat, the guy who's gonna win you the game, the guy who's gonna make the difference, and that's been him. Uh, in those years. And um, again, you know, you just wonder, we look at the numbers and we wonder where Mario would have been. We look at the numbers and we wonder where Sid had been. And if he hadn't missed basically you know, all the time, he's missed all these, all the time that he's missed in his career. Um, and another time when you weren't sure if he was going to be able to come back from the concussion, what was he going to be like? Was he going to be able to be the same, et cetera? Um, so 
Um, you know, I don't think they, you know, I think they've really lost a beat in that sense. And I don't think it's really all that different. You know, they built the team around him just like they built it around Mario. Uh, now they're trying to do, I mean, that's what they're trying to do again. I mean, you look at with what Kyle Dubas has said and what he's doing. He's not, and he, and he said this, so I'm going to be paraphrasing him a bit, but I mean, he's not interested in just squeaking into the playoffs and getting kicked right out. What he's interested in is developing a team that can make another run. And when I think when he says that, I personally feel like what he's saying is that's not this coming season and it's maybe not next season, but it's like maybe two to three seasons away. You know, we're still waiting for Sid to sign a contract, but I think we can all see him playing for at least a few more seasons. And I think Dubas is when he Dubas talks about this, what I think he's aiming at is having the kind of team that you can maybe have Sid and make one more run. That's not that's not this coming season. It's probably not next season, but maybe the year after. Is so they're still good? building around them. Okay. So with that said, let's talk about that con about the contract just a little bit. Um, you know, is this gonna get done? He got up in front of all those people in Vegas uh what two days ago yeah. and he said, Yeah, uh, you know, I, I we're we're I'm more optimistic than ever that it's going to get done. Do you are you hearing whispers about what the sticking point is? No, but I think you could say, look if you look at his comments in in the NHL media tour he did starting yesterday. Um, his comments were look look there's no question it's going to get done. But what he said, what I thought was the most telling was you sort of have to ask yourself every year how you're feeling. Yeah, again I'm paraphrasing. How are you feeling? You know, and he and he said the passion is still there for me. Like I feel the same passion now as I did heading into my first training camp. So it's not a question of, is it going to get done? It is going to get done. Um, but that almost makes me, it sound like I, the one thing I've thought while this was all going on before his comments um, was that Sid's trying to figure out how long he wants to play himself. You know, and, and I, I don't, and when I hear him then make a comment to say, it's look, it's something you have to sort of take stock about every year. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, and so I wonder, I just wonder in the back of my mind, if, if what happens with Sid and the Penguins is they do a series of one year deals or maybe a series of two year deals. I was just thinking uh, that, you know, based I, that, on what, yeah, he's, he's going to finish his career with the Penguins. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, and he's going to play for as long as he feels like playing. But I just wonder if this summer he's been wondering a little bit about how, how he, how long he feels like playing and trying to do the planning about, okay, what's the contract look like? Um, I think it's interesting that, you know, he's thinking this, but yet you see him still sitting at the top of the league with points every year, you know, maybe not number one or number two, he's not that guy anymore, but he plays a 200 foot game and he's always productive. What do you have last year? 40 goals? 90, 94 yeah. points, 40 goals. Yeah, he's, 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 he's a freak of nature like that. Like, look, we've had other guys. Look, we had just we just had Joe Pavelski retire, and Joe Pavelski was an incredible goal scorer. Um, at at even uh you know older than Sid, but he's not. He doesn't have the same dimensions to his game. Thirty seven. Yeah, I mean, Sid is Sid's. You just said it. You know, he's a two hundred foot player. He's the captain. He can end up being a captain with one team longer than anybody in NHL history. He's going to tie Steve Eiserman this year, uh, and he'll surpass him. Um, he's playing at an incredibly high level, and it's just year in and year out. And you still see him whipping through the neutral zone. You say to yourself, "How is it possible that this guy can still skate like this?" And we always see and hear about his intensity. You know, after his shift, he goes to the bench. He's on. He's on the iPad. He's yeah. telling people he's another coach on and off the ice. And and some some like that. Some young guys like that, bringing him up under his wing and helping him along. But others are like, "Dude, just let me play." Like, where's the happy medium there? Well, look, I mean, Sid will find a way to work it out with any of his teammates, but he's going to be available, and he's going to he's going to try to help them in every single right. way. Okay. Look, I, I would be shocked if there's any young player comes through that door and feels like he doesn't need to listen to Sidney Crosby's advice or, or guidance. I mean, I would just be shocked. And, I mean, this is one of the things that Dubas has talked about is, is having these young players around Sid um, to learn from him before he has to hang them up. Um, and, and that's, I think that's absolutely could be very critical of the Penguins because you ask anybody who's played with Sid, um, what do you take away from it? Again, 
Uh, they may not talk about it much every day, but um, they, they are, trust me, they're inspired by what he's doing and what he does in the off season to get himself ready to play. And I, every- and I think, yeah, you're right. I think credit goes to Mario too, because that's what he did with him. And that's what he did with Malkin. And, yeah. and, and now they're, they're just uh, paying it forward. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And Sid's, and Sid's, Sid's very conscious of his need, his, his, the fact that he needs to do this. Yeah. And so he's, and he's going to do it. Um, and, um, you know, everybody, everybody makes out because of it. It'll be interesting to see what happens when uh, Malkin's contract is up, because I think Latang still has so much left in the tank that he'll still be around a little bit. But I just, Gino, I don't know. Well, Latang's got, Latang's got four more years. Gino's got two. Um, and to your point, my sense, and this is all it is, is a sense. I don't know anything. My sense is that when Gino gets to the end of that contract, he's probably going to retire. Which mm. makes sense. You know, I mean, I mean he's, he's 38 now. You know, he'll be 39 in that last season. Um, you know, yes, people play even beyond 40, but let's remember, that's not typical. He's not going to play till he's 85 like Yager? <laughs> or 86. Yeah, yeah no, he's, he's not. <laughs> He's not. Hey, who knows? Maybe, hey, Bob, maybe. speaking of Yager, I'm going to go back to this because I really want to know what happened to those bobbleheads and how many did you get? <laughs> I don't have any of them. And I, you know what? We never did get a great detailed story, did we, of exactly how how those things got pilfered? Somebody ransacked the truck and, and stole and how, the they, and how they found how they found them though, you know, <laughs> how, how they got found. But they got found, and it was such a great it was such a great story. Well, you know, I, I love the Penguins doing that video that day with Yager getting in the car to go out after them. The whole, whole bit was – it was so great to see Yager back in Pittsburgh. Yeah. It, it, it okay. really was. I mean, yes, the breakup was ugly. I was bitter, Bob. I but, was bitter know, for a long time. Well so, well, so were a lot of people, Mark. I mean, look, it's – it's. You it went to Washington. Why not be bitter? <laughs> well, you know, or later going to Philly when it looked like, you know, Mario said maybe they would – you know, maybe they would – interested in signing Yager and he ends up going to Philly. Yeah. Uh, it, look, it was, it was ugly, but, um, times healed it. Um, he was incredible while he was here and it's so great that he's now, um, you know, he's now sort of back in the fold with the Penguins. His Jersey retirement was an amazing ceremony last season. Um, and, uh, I'm just glad to see him. I'm happy he's back to be honest with you. Yeah. He, he, uh, he rectified himself. He really did. Hey, hey, Bob, can we get some thoughts on Dubas' uh, off-season moves, uh, free yeah. agency trades, whatnot? Yeah, you know, so look, he, he took a home run swing last summer, right? He comes in, you know, he goes out and he gets Carlson and he gets some other guys, um, you know, and it didn't work out. You know, they missed the playoffs by three points last season after missing it just by one this, this, the previous season. And a lot of that was because of the power play. And he's he's done eh, kind of the same thing. But not exact, not not to the extent that he did the previous summer. So he goes out and he gets Grizzly, um, you know, a veteran defenseman. Um, and so they needed somebody there. They moved on on, on POJ. They, you know, he's in St. Louis now. Um, Grizzly's an interesting character because, you know, he played a lot with Charlie McAvoy. He was on the top pair in Boston. You know, he's thirty. He's thirty years old now. He didn't have a great season. You know, Jim Montgomery talked at, at times in the playoffs last season about the fact that he wasn't transitioning quick enough. So that'll be something to watch for Matt Grizzly. Um, and people have him sort of inked in at the, as a bottom pair guy, uh, you know, maybe with Jack St. Ivany. But I would say this, I'm not sure that Ryan Graves is going to play with Latang. You know, Joseph played with Latang most of last season. And, and we know that Graves had a disastrous season in his first year in Pittsburgh. Would they consider putting Grizzly with Latang? Um, he's played a lot of big minute nights with McAvoy, so he knows what it's like. He, we'll see if he can get his game there. So that's an interesting, you know, he's not a big guy, but he's a, he's a veteran presence. Um, they added Sebastian Ajo on defense. You know, they get him from the Islanders. So he's been a six or seven D his whole career. And he'll play the same role here. Um, Rutger McGrory was a real shocker. The Braden Yeager for Rutger McGrory trade, that kind of a trade from two elite prospects, one for one, and you just never see that. Um, and, and I'm really anxious to see this kid captain Team USA to the World Junior title last season. 
I'm not a fan of him basically being drafted by Winnipeg and saying, I don't want to go there. I got to be honest with you. I love the intangibles of players. And if you can be captain of the U.S. World Junior Team, you got something special. And he's not only got that, but he's got the skill level. Look, he's not the fastest guy. He's not the highest skill guy, but everyone talks about his competitiveness. So I like the intangible you get with a guy who's captain the team at that level. It's going to be really interesting to see where they can try and fit him in. But I got to say, I'm not I'm not a fan of young guys just telling the team that drafted them, not playing for you. So now, we'll see. Interesting that you say that because look how many guys do that in other other professional sports. You got it in football. You got it in basketball. You don't really see it in baseball because that's a whole other animal with all the different tiers of, of guys. But uh, you know, you only got really what do you got? You got three tiers at the professional level of hockey with the AHL, ECHL, and, and you know, uh, yeah. subsequent leagues like that, and then the NHL. I, everything I've read about this kid, like you just said, is it because he is the next uh, uh, Sidney Crosby or, or someone like that? It's all the other intangibles that he brings to the table in the locker room and on the ice that make him special. Uh, I think they kind of stole him uh, as much as I liked uh, Jaeger. I, I don't think he is going to bring to the table with this kid has the opportunity. Well, he, yeah. He's not going to bring exactly the same thing, but he, we got to wait and see how it works out. You know, I'm a guy who's like I, the idea of saying who won the trade the day you made the trade, I think is ludicrous. I agree like, with that. Any sport. So let's just wait and see. But the, I just wanted to did finish the question, though. Yeah, Kevin Hayes, we'll see where he fits in. Could he be the 3C? Could they move him to the wing? He's big. He's not particularly quick. He was a healthy scratch at times. I think Blake Lazat is the guy who's going to have the biggest immediate impact. He's a real – he's a fiery guy. I mean, he's a gritty guy to play down on your fourth line. Um, and, and, I mean, he's a terrific penalty killer. Uh, undrafted guy who's only played one game in the American leg in his career. That's a rarity. You know, he's played all these years in, in, in L.A. And then Cody Glass, another big body, but he's coming off his worst season in the NHL. Where does he fit in? If you look at what Dubas has done this summer, he's brought in all these guys that I've talked about here. And it, the big piece of it is try and rebuild the bottom six because the top six is more or less, you know what it's going to look like. You think, um, you know, Drew O'Connor probably would stay with Sid, I would guess even though he doesn't – you wouldn't want him to settle in as a number one left wing on your team. That's not, I don't think that's really his skill set, but he's been good. I think we all like him, and he's getting better. But the question is, what does the bottom six look like? They, they've got – the Penguins, as they go into camp, they they got legitimately a dozen guys competing for six spots on the bottom six. And a lot of them are centers, like, like Lazat, like Hayes. You've got Eller, and I love Eller. I love Eller. I thought he brought them so many good things last season. I would try to find, even though he's 35, I would try to find a way to keep him. He's a gamer for me. Um, so where, do, which of these centers play on the wing? How does it all work out? You know, I mean, so these are the things that will have to be worked out by Mike Sullivan through the preseason. So I basically, mean, what, I'm sorry for cutting you off there, but basically what you're saying is if they find a third and fourth line that's going to be somewhat productive for them, we could see them back in the playoffs 24-25 season. Well, they're not going to look. They're not going to get there without that. So yes, if they think they're making the playoffs this year, they better find a bottom six that can impact the game. It's not really about the points. It's not about the goals and the points either. I mean, Lazat's not a guy who's going to, you know, who's going to score a ton. You know, Kevin Hayes is he's seen better days as a scorer. He's a pass first guy. So if you're going to take advantage of what he brings you on the third line, you're hoping he's good defensively. Again, not not great speed for him, but if he's gonna he's a pass first guy, if he's gonna make an impact a little bit offensively, who's he gonna play with? Is yep. Pustin ready? Is Pustin gonna be a guy who can get his scoring? I love Pustin. Yeah, I love his speed. Too. I think he's a I think he's an underrated defensive player, but he's just to me when I watch him, I just don't think he's ever gonna be a big finisher. But and so if, if you're gonna play Hayes at center, you need to play him with guys who who can get the puck and maybe make something happen with it occasionally. So it isn't just about the the points. It's about can you impact a game in other ways? That's why I like Lazat so much. He'll be physical. He'll hit you. He'll be great on the PK, and he'll just be a spark plug. And quite frankly, when I think about the Penguins the last couple of years, boy, I don't think they've really played with enough emotion. So I think he, I think he could be a, a key piece of it. He so, sounds like a guy that we let go to Seattle in the expansion draft. 
yeah, I mean, look, these guys, these guys are not easy to find. Um, and so you, you've, you, you've got, you've got to, you've got to put guys in these positions. We talked earlier about knowing your roles. So, you know, the Penguins haven't had that these last few years. They, the, the bottom line is you got Latang, you got Malkin, you got Carlson, you got Sid. Okay. We know more or less what we're going to get out of those guys. It, nothing. The one thing that hasn't changed is these years have gone by these last three, four or five years. Those guys, they're going to slow down, even though Sid looks like he's not going to slow down. Yeah. Sid will slow down. You yeah. need a supporting cast to better support those players. Right. Hang right. supporting cast hasn't been up to the task the last couple of seasons. Could this one do it? Maybe. They, I'll be honest with you, at the moment, they don't look like a playoff team to me. Okay. Because, because if, you think about, if you think about if they're going to get in, all right, who is a playoff team that's coming out? Washington beat them last year. I think Washington's going to be better, and not because of Pierre Luc Dubois that I'm not a big fan of. I just think they're. I think they've made a lot of moves this season, this off season. I think the Capitals are going to be better, and I also know this: Jersey didn't make the playoffs last year, and I think they had the best summer of anybody in the division easily. Maybe the best summer of anybody in the league in building their defense and getting Markstrom in goal. They are. They are prob- I think they're going to win the division. I think Carolina's time has kind of come and gone. Carolina's still going to be very, very good, but I'm not sure that their window is still there um, to, to to get to the final and win a cup. And I, I think Jersey's going to be – so Jersey's going to be one team that's going to pass the Penguins. Uh, so who's going to come out? Who's going to go in? That's, we'll why they play, that's why they play the games, right, my yeah. friend? Hey, yeah. thank you for joining us tonight. This has been uh, – very educational, very informative, and, and I'm all fired up for hockey season. I can't – as great as the Steelers, I, I felt they looked pretty damn good, okay, uh, on Sunday. They only had two three and outs. That's a big plus to me. But uh, as much as I enjoyed that, uh, I'm looking forward to watching the boys on ice soon. So thanks um, for, for spending some time with us tonight, Bob. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's been my pleasure. And, and thank you all so much for having me on. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Let's go, Pens. Yep. Fellas, that was uh, very informative. What what an interesting what an interesting ride he had. He actually got to live out his dream, uh, being being involved with that organization all his life. You know that that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, uh, any final thoughts before we we get out of here, and wrap up the show because. Uh, it's almost go time for our pigskin. Hey, look, it's almost go time for our pigskin show. So, uh, yeah. Hey, we did get one high from a guy in uh, up in Canada. How you doing, Barbecue with Neil? Thanks for joining us tonight. We're glad to have you here. Hey, that Barbecue mu- Moose, if you guys had Barbecue Moose, it's really good up in Canada. Where's that? Where is it? I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, don't pay any attention to him. Don't pay any attention to him. T says, where "Hey, you, I'm a, you can find me on Instagram and in the X at one T Youngie." Excellent. We know where we can find Rasheen. Uh, he's, he's in the Commander friend. Center. Yeah, he's Command there. Center. That Commander Command. Oh, the Commander. That's going to be Center. our future home for uh, our in-person shows. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully, by the end of the month, we'll be able to do one of our live shows out at Rasheen's Command Center. Um, Chops couldn't join us tonight. Sorry, everybody. But he will be on the Pigskin Show coming up next. Um, you can find him at The Real Big Chops or by his government name on Facebook, Michael Gregory Mills. Join us here on the Original Sports Podcast by checking out our webpage, podpage.com, Original Sports Podcast with Mark Meriday. Hey, like our Facebook page, join the conversation on Twitter, reach out to us on Snapchat. All of that is OSP with MM. You can also find us on Instagram, TikTok, and uh, obviously YouTube at Original Sports Podcast. Big shout out to our networks, Let's Talk Sports, Sideline Sports, uh, Elite Sports and Entertainment, Manning Media, and Pete One Network. It's been great working with all of them. Um, Remember, you can catch this show if you can't. Watch it on your computer. You can catch it on Roku from 7 to 8 every Tuesday night. We are live 
on there. Uh, let us know if you have any comments, questions, suggestions of future guests. If you want to jump on yourself and talk with us, uh, email us at originalsportspodcast.gmail.com. Also, I want to give a shout out to my guy, Steve Medley, for doing our voice intro, Charlie Hodgson for doing our music intro and outro. Catch us next Tuesday to experience the O on the original sports podcast. Yeah.